Hi friends, welcome back to Coffee with Ravi. Today we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Sundaram. Dr. Sundaram is uh, head of the cardiology division and uh, he's done more for cardiology in this area than any other person that I know. So we're really glad to have him come and share some knowledge. Our topic today is to talk about atrial fibrillation. It's a common condition and we're gonna talk about what causes atrial fibrillation, what to do, what are the dangers, what are the new advances. So thank you, Dr. Sundaram, for joining us. Thank you, Ravi. Thanks for having me. Uh, on the topic of atrial fibrillation, what is atrial fibrillation and why is it important for patients to be treated or recognized for that? Yeah, it is an important topic because it's very common after the age of 55 or 60. Um, what it is is heart, rather than pumping at a regular beat, regular rhythm, it's, it fibrillates. Um, and when we talk about fibrillation of the heart, there are two major kind. One is the top chamber fibrillation, the other one is the bottom chamber fibrillation. The bottom chamber fibrillation is called ventricular fibrillation, that is life-threatening. Usually patients don't even make it uh, unless they are treated right away. But the top chamber fibrillation is called atrial fibrillation, where the top chamber, rather than pumping at a regular interval, it uh, fibrillates. And there are a lot of reasons for atrial fibrillation, and it can happen without any reason in younger population. But most common reason it happens in older people or older adults is uh, uh, ma the heart having issues before. One of the common reasons is long-standing high blood pressure, even when treated, but if it is not well controlled over a period of time, that's one of the common reasons. Number two, in, if patients are obese, that predisposes the heart to have atrial fibrillation. Patients with sleep apnea have uh, more uh, uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation. And other heart conditions, like if you had a heart attack before, and any long-standing heart ailment predisposes uh, patients to um, atrial fibrillation. So it's the so there's four chambers in the yeah. heart, right? The two top chambers, the two bottom One chambers, and it's the top chambers that are yeah. quivering. Yeah. In other words, they're not uh, not, not beating not at a regular, beating rate, at a regular, regular rate. rate. So wh how, wh what's the danger to our patients then if, if it's not recognized? Yeah. So and how do they recognize it too? I usually tell my patients that it's never life-threatening in a sense that directly doesn't make the heart to stop or whatnot. One of the most critical issue with atrial fibrillation, it's an important cause of stroke in that population. What happens is when the top chamber doesn't pump at a regular interval, uh, blood pools in, in the top chamber. Actually, there is a pocket in the left top chamber called left atrial appendage. And that is the place where most commonly blood clot forms. The reason is easy to understand. If you have a regular pumping, the chamber is emptied fully. If it is fibrillating, it never get a chance to empty. So if it doesn't empty properly, blood pools in there. And once in a while, the chamber contracts aggressively and that displaces the clot and the clot goes directly to the brain and causes a stroke. That is a major concern because stroke is not something anybody wants to have. It's a simple rhythm problem. Sometimes they don't even know they have it. But once you have a stroke, life completely changes. And a lot of time, the stroke caused by atrial fibrillation is usually large, and it has real long-term implications. So that is the concern um, that anybody who has atrial fibrillation should be diagnosed, and they need to be treated promptly, which we'll talk about. So from, from a stroke prevention standpoint, primarily, yes. uh, how do patients even know that yeah. they have it? Yeah. You know? So, you know, it, there are times patients may be completely asymptomatic. They don't feel anything, and they incidentally get diagnosed when they go to see a doctor. So that's why it's critical after a certain age, you have periodic yearly wellness exam and have an EKG done, so at least you are diagnosed but also they may have symptoms. The symptoms are you may really feel your heart is irregular or it may beat fast. Atrial fibrillation is known to have, uh, known to cause fast heartbeats, so you may feel that. 
you may feel tired and fatigued and you may feel shortness of breath so there are other associated symptoms when you have those when you go to a doctor they check the pulse and usually it's irregular and an EKG will confirm the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. The diagnosis is not very complicated. You don't need very complex CAT scans or MRIs or all those things. A simple EKG will, uh, will diagnose atrial fibrillation. From the standpoint of then treatment, treatment. Uh, um, is it, you know, how do we, is it good to knock it back into rhythm? Is it good yeah. to just control the rhythm? And how do we prevent strokes? Yeah, so when we treat atrial fibrillation, the primary goal is stroke prevention uh, because stroke causes real, true, long-term disability. So we take it very seriously. So one of the goal is to get the rhythm back to normal. So when we see a patient, we look into several things. Is there a chance we will know how long they're in atrial fibrillation? What are the other associated factors? Which will help us to decide, is there a chance the patient will go back to a regular good rhythm? But our goal is primarily always try to get them to a good rhythm. That's usually done with what we call as cardioversion. We give a electrical shock to the heart. Uh, but very critical to know that we don't do cardioversion unless they are treated with uh, um, blood thinner for a long time. So before we even talk about uh, shocking the heart out, first when we make a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, if we don't know how long they are on that rhythm, we immediately start the patient on a blood thinner. So blood thinners are primary uh, treatment to start and after three weeks a good blood thinning effect by blood test or whatnot, then we will try to shock them. And majority of the patients can be shocked out of atrial fibrillation, but over a period of time, atrial fibrillation comes back. Um, so we can talk about what is the long-term uh, uh, treatment plan. So primarily we can try to convert them to a good rhythm and if they turn into a good rhythm we watch them if it comes back there are medications we can use to keep them in a good rhythm or we do a complex procedure now called atrial fibrillation ablation where we go through the groin make some changes in the electrical conduction of the top chamber so the atrial fibrillation will be gone but even though we say all those things it's not always possible to achieve a regular rhythm in all this, all the patients. A considerable portion of a patients with atrial fibrillation will remain in atrial fibrillation lifelong. That's where we need to talk about blood thinner and the side effects of blood thinner. What do we do if they can't take a blood thinner? So to recap again, we'll try to get them into a good rhythm by shocking them after a blood thinner. And if it works, we continue to watch them. If it doesn't work, we can think of uh, ablation. And if nothing works, then leave them on atrial fibrillation. But then the primary goal becomes how to prevent the stroke and then you know, lifelong blood thinner or other options. So then on the blood thinner uh, uh, note of it, uh, uh, the blood thinner is more for stroke prevention. Yeah, yeah. Do everybody need to get on blood thinners? Uh, yeah, so there is a mechanism we call CHAD score. We calculate the risk of um, blood clot leaving to the brain. Um, without going into the detail, it's a scientific way of calculating what is your risk. If your doctor calculates your risk is high to have a stroke, then yes, you need to go on a blood thinner um, long term. Most of the elderly patients, the risk will be high. They need to be on a blood thinner. Usually, it's the younger population of atrial fibrillation may not be at a higher risk, so they don't need long-term uh, blood thinner. But most of them would need a blood thinner. And on the topic of blood thinners, is it the newer anticoagulants versus Coumadin? Yeah. What's kind of a quick take on yeah. that? So atrial fibrillation, we divide them into two broad categories. One, if you have atrial fibrillation because one of your valve is not functioning well, that's called valvular atrial fibrillation. 
And if you don't have that, it's because of high blood pressure or you're obese or you're sleep apnea or without any reason, then it is non-valvular. In patients with valvular atrial fibrillation, for example, if your mitral valve is plugged up or other valve diseases, then Coumadin is better for long term because it has proven effect. Those patients have higher risk of atrial, fib uh, atrial fibrillation, higher risk of stroke, and the stroke is really severe in most of them. In non-valvular atrial fibrillation, the newer agents can be used, which you know you don't need to do a blood test periodically, and you don't have a lot of dietary restrictions or whatnot. It's easy to manage. The newer agents can be used, and if if there are patients who won't be able to take uh, blood thinner for several reasons, we can talk about. Then we need to look at other options. options. So, lastly, to finish our discussion, and I know it's a broad topic. Uh, patients ask me sometimes about the use of Apple Watch for monitoring yeah. and the newer Watchman device. Can you touch on yeah. those two yeah. briefly in conclusion? Yeah, there are a lot of devices coming into the market um, which claim they can diagnose atrial fibrillation, but most of these devices can sense if your rhythm is irregular. So I'm not totally opposed to that. It's not a scientific way to make the diagnosis, but if you're at a higher risk to develop atrial fibrillation, it will give you an idea. It can give you some kind of a recording which you can show to the doctor. So it will be a good start. And I'm supportive of that because if there is a chance of atrial fibrillation, the best is to make the diagnosis so you will be treated. And then we talk about other options like Watchman's device. One of the major issue we face in patients with atrial fibrillation, one in 10 patients with atrial fibrillation will not be even able to start the blood thinner because either they had a big stroke recently or they had stomach bleeding, which you see commonly, and uh, or other bleeding in, in their kidneys or in their urine. So we, we call them as uh, high risk for bleeding. And we cannot even think of giving them blood thinner because then if they bleed, it becomes life-threatening condition. And in some group of patients, they may not have the uh, contraindications to a blood thinner, but once you start them, they start developing this. So the literature says anywhere from two to three out of 10 patients with atrial fibrillation would not be able to start or would not be able to continue the blood thinner. In those patients, we use uh, modern devices called left atrial occlusion devices, left atrial appendage closure devices, where we can go through the groin and make a hole in the septum of the heart because from here, from the leg you go to the right side of the heart, make a hole, get into the left top chamber of the heart and put uh, an umbrella-like device. What that does is that left atrium, which is a pouch, it closes the pouch. Even if there is a clot formed inside, it won't be able to get into the system and cause a stroke. In patients who have contraindications to blood thinner, who cannot take a blood thinner, that has have been proven very well that is very good in preventing the risk of stroke. None of these are 100% proof to stop, uh, stop a, a stroke, but most of them are highly effective. So the sequence would be, if you can take a blood thinner, best to take a blood thinner. If we can get you into a regular rhythm, that's even better. But we are stuck with atrial fibrillation, cannot take a blood thinner, absolutely important to talk to your doctor about, can I have the left atrial appendage closed so that clot won't go up to the brain. This is uh, uh, truly amazing, and uh, thank you for such a nice uh, synopsis. Uh, as always, uh, uh, feel free to email us the questions. Uh, you could call us, uh, or you could call Dr. Sundaram's office if you have any questions about uh, follow-up about atrial fibrillation, too, and we'd be glad to answer these questions. Thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you.